Hebrews chapter 5. So I'd like to start at verse 5. And this is um, <clears throat> this is the first mention of Melchizedek in the New Testament. <clears throat> so let's start at verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to mean, be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also in another place. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right. <clears throat> These scriptures are speaking <clears throat> of Melchizedek the priest. I've heard people talk about this this part about Jesus with strong tears and crying and though he were a son yet learned the obedience by the things that he suffered and um, but folks and I'll, I'll clearly show you this in just a minute. You can actually see it in the scriptures there if you just look but I'll clearly show you how it is that. <clears throat> These scriptures are talking specifically. They are talking specifically about the Melchizedek priesthood and of Christ being a representative of that priesthood. And so, um, and it's not talking just about um, the work of a mediator, though that's part of it, and Jesus as a Melchizedek priest did finish off the mediator work of the Levitical priesthood. But most people think that this is all just related to Jesus, you know, not wanting to die and him crying and asking God to save him and all that and, you know, get me out of this, but, you know, and that sort of thing. And this is all the premise of this began by saying, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who? in the days of his so <clears throat> it is um, again relating to the eternal priesthood not just the temporal work of the the priesthood of Levi Jesus is not just uh, well, let's say it like this what Jesus is doing here with his crying and tears and all this stuff he's not doing as an individual son and I'll show you that clearly through this that that is making this clear he's not doing this as an individual son he's doing this as a priest and the people the priesthood that he's intervening for is his body the one that he wants to to have saved here uh the in the sense of what it's saying here the father saves him from death meaning his body would be raised up with him that we too would be, and the way that I know that, again, I, I will go over this and go over this and show you back and forth from these scriptures that that's what this is saying. This is not just Jesus praying for himself, or that wouldn't be the work of a Melchizedek priest. Am I right or wrong? I mean, at least consider that thought. That would not be the work. He is standing as a priest, and a priest stands on behalf of the people. So, his intercession here is seen in terms of, you know, strong crying and learning obedience and suffering till we all come in, till we're all one, till we've all entered into this thing. And these tears and all this strong crying were for us and not for himself. Again, I'll show you exactly the premise I'm basing that on. Because these tears and strong crying were not done as a son, but as a priest for others. That's what you have to consider. All right. Now, let's look in verse 8 because it's one that we're uh, so, so very familiar with. <clears throat> Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. The 
Though, he, I mean, have anybody ever heard this scripture talked about before? Every time this scripture is discussed, it's talked about as a son. And that you relate this to you as a son of God. And that sons learn obedience by the things they suffer. But that's, it's saying just the opposite of that. It's saying though he were a son, that's not where he's learning his obedience. Let me just read my statement here. Learning obedience by the things you suffer is not related to being a son, but to the specific calling and function of a Melchizedek priest. Now, I'm going to say it with full confidence, and then I'll prove it again in just a minute. This is not at all talking about Jesus as an individual son trying to get God to raise him from the dead. This is talking about a Melchizedek priest and the specific calling and function of a Melchizedek priest. The son, folks, the son was already obedient. Can I get amen from anybody? Or was he? Was he some sort of disobedient thing that needed to be whipped into shape? I'm telling you, the son was already obedient. And in fact, it says in what John 8, 29, I, as a son, Jesus speaking, I do always those things that please the father. There's no question the son was obedient. Yeah, Greg? And to finish the work. Huh. Amen. So this, this is not a question of the son. The son is already obedient. But this is, this is obedience in doing the priesthood. This is obedience in doing that. The son does what he does for the father. But the priest does what he does for others. Okay? Now, there, you know, you say, well, are you just, you know, splitting hairs here? Oh, no, not at all. Le well, let's put it this way. I'm not. I mean, maybe the writer of Hebrews is, but I'm just, I'm just telling you what he's saying here. And he is clearly saying that this, he, that, that the Melchizedek priest is learning obedience in relationship to others. Not a son learning to be obedient to his father. Because I can tell you there was never any question about the son being obedient to the father. But Jesus was functioning now on our behalf. On his, you can say on his body's behalf. But that's us. That's all of us. So, um, and I said that, that a, a son does what he does for the father. That's his motivation. But a priest... It says, in fact, it's uh, verse 1 of this same chapter, verse uh, Hebrews 5, 1. For every priest taken from among men is ordained for men. Not, you know, he's, he's, yes, he's working toward God, but he's working on behalf of men. The Son is working on behalf of the Father. Okay? So every ounce of these scriptures, folks, you can't read anything into this except the context, and the context is Melchizedek priest, <clears throat> ordained for men, it says. Jesus knew as a son God was going to raise him from the dead. Why? On what basis? He never sinned. Can I get an amen? He never sinned. So if he never sinned, why is he sitting there going, oh, please raise me up, oh, my God. Oh, I don't want to, you know. He knows God's going to raise him up, but his prayer is not on his behalf. His prayer is on behalf of us and his body. Now you can see that. Keep, keep your place here, but you can clearly see that over in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. People call this, you know, a lot of different names. I think it really is a high priestly prayer. Uh, in my Bible, it's the, the publishers put above chapter 17, Christ's high priestly intercessory prayer. Now, what is he praying? Oh, God, save him from hell. No. Now, this is pretty much one of the final prayers. Save him from hell. Oh, God, please let him get saved and go to heaven. No. 
it's interesting that he is praying nothing as a meteor priest. He's praying as a communion priest. Every ounce of this, you can just read it, that they may be one, that they may be one with us even as we are one. Folks, even as means this is an eternal thing that was before men that we're being brought into and that this is intercession, not mediator work. The mediator, when, when the mediator stands between God and man and the mediator brings the two together, you, the mediator quits. It's over with. The two are one. We've been made one with Jesus, and now it's intercession. And the intercession is not save, you know, save them or help them or whatever. The intercession is, oh, Lord, that they may know that you love them as you love me. All of that is communion. It's one. It's, it's feeding them what he's feeding on, his bread, uh, his body his blood, his life. It's, it's just communion work. And we're still acting like the, the uh, Aaron priesthood is still going and we're all having to mediate and all of our prayers are mediator prayers and that has been settled and oneness has come about and now when there's only one, there's, a mediator can't get in between one. So he sits down as it were <clears throat> so you know jesus prayer here is you know there, there is this groaning that there will come this realization not just for the ones that are there but for those that will come in the future that we all may all know that we're one and the whole chapter that's why i'm not going to just sit here and read it um because the whole chapter is based on that and you would think you would think if, if, if the mediator thing wasn't clear in Jesus' mind, he would be standing in between trying to bring two together, but he's praying like they're already one. In his mind, he's Melchizedek priesthood. He's not Aaron priesthood. And the whole point of the Levitical priesthood was always uniting man and God, and then they'd sin, and then unite them back, and then they'd sin. But they were never one. They were just made okay with each other. And they, so they'd kill another lamb. Well, folks, communion is stop killing the lamb and start eating the lamb. You understand what I mean. Stop killing it for what you do wrong and start eating it for who you are. Enter into this communion relationship. <clears throat> so, Jesus has a burden in John 17, but that burden isn't fear that we're going to drop off into hell. That burden is I want them to know that that this has moved out of a mediator priesthood. And it's, we've moved into a whole other level of priesthood. And Jesus is, as it were in John 17, serving communion. And he's saying, I agree with you, and they are going to agree with you, and we're all going to, and that they may know, and enters into all that. Look in uh, Ephesians 4. Um, <clears throat> Because here uh, in Hebrews, so I'll just mention it. In fact, you're turning to Hebrews 4, so I'll uh, read it. Verse 9 says, and being made perfect. And being made perfect. Being made perfect. Jesus, as the Son of God, was already perfect. Am I right or wrong? He was perfect. He, he never sinned. How is he going to be made perfect as a son of God? He's not. He was born the son of God. He is after his father's kind. He is of the nature of the father. That perfection never applies to a son, just like the obedience doesn't apply to a son. That perfection there applies to being a Melchizedek priest and functioning for others. Because he was already perfect as a son. And again, because he never sinned. So, the word perfect is the word completion, is the joining in. It's becoming one as a new man on, the, on a new covenant basis. And, and we'll read this here in Ephesians so you can see it. But I want to show you that it's actually there in the scriptures that we're reading too. Just to, just to make sure. Ephesians 4, um, verse 13, starting in verse 13. 
<clears throat> okay, so there's this work of the ministry. And verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints. There's a, there's a perfecting coming, but it's not Jesus isn't being made perfect in himself. Being made perfect is talking about the perfecting of the saints as his body or as one. Be, um, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, a perfect man. There it is. There's the work of the priesthood to bring us all together in one. Then the mediator is finished. Now all you do is intercede to keep to, in relationship to that, that they may continue to know, to grow up into this reality. But not to bring it about. To bring it about would be the work of a mediator. Am I right, Mallory? <laughs> to bring it about... So you, your intercession here, and Paul's intercession is along the lines of this, that it is true, now Lord, awaken us to this. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and that's the new man, unto the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ. And this is, this is the word fullness there is the same word as complete in Colossians uh, 2.10, where it says you are complete in him. There is this perfection that is nothing more than the finishing the work of mediatorship to bring us together in one. And once that's done, Jesus quits praying like a mediator and he starts praying like an intercessor, one who already knows it's settled. So, but he goes on here. That we may henceforth be no more children, meaning in our mind and in our understanding. Because he says, It's tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that whichever joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All this is saying is that we are continually feeding on the communion and growing up in this, growing up in what is settled, that we are one. We're not trying to become one. We're not trying to become something. We are something. We're trying to learn what we are. We're trying to acknowledge what we are to the acknowledging of the truth in Christ is the way Paul put it in the book of Philemon. So, um, let's see. Let's go back to uh, Hebrews and let me show you now in those scriptures. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> okay, what, what we were reading there is all about the new man and that we may grow up into Christ who is the head and the new man is head and body and he's the head and we're the body and we're coming to this perfect man. Many members one body amen oneness has taken place okay so the whole context of this is in light of this one new man all right now look in uh, hebrews 5 verse 5 so also christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest but he that said unto him thou art my son today have i begotten thee as he saith also in another place thou art a priest after the order forever after the order of melchizedek what is he saying this is a new man mentality. He's saying, just as you are a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, it's in the same manner that God said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Where did those words come from? They came out of the second psalm, and they relate to Christ in resurrection. That's right. God is begetting a new son. Not the only begotten son. The only begotten was Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnate son. But this is talking, this day have I begotten thee. The day of resurrection. That new son, folks, is Jesus in his new body, which is us. Do you see how going into the very next verse on Melchizedek, He's setting the stage for a new man mentality when he says that. He wants you to already see that he's talking about not Jesus as an individual son, but the work of Melchizedek that 
as a priest, it brought it all together as one. And now it's one. So, um, and, and just to, now here I told you I'd prove it. Every one of these scriptures, I want you to see, it's like a sandwich. Whatever's on the inside is sandwiched by what's on both sides of it. Let's see what's, what's on both sides of it. Verse 6, as he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the Mel, uh, order of Melchizedek. Okay, that's one piece of bread. Then you got what's inside. Verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. Now look at verse 10. Here's the other piece of bread. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Does anybody see that on both sides of these scriptures, he's plainly said we're talking about the order of Melchizedek. There's no question about it. It's not a mystery. It's not hidden. You can't twist it. It's clearly anything he says about learning obedience comes in between verse 10 and verse 6, which says called after the order of Melchizedek on both sides of it. That's the context. There is no other context. He is talking about this oneness that Jesus is crying and burdened and weeping to bring us into in fullness and in knowledge and in understanding. So um, it, it's the, it is the basis of the new covenant. Now, consider this. The new covenant was first instituted and talked about when? The day Jesus sat down with people at a table. He sat at a table, folks. He didn't sit at an altar. He didn't, he didn't stand and bring them to an altar and said, we're going to kill another thing. He sat at a table and he had communion with them. Because he's a communion priest, not a meteor priest. He sat down and he said, here, eat this. This is what you are. You are my body. Eat, take, eat. Take in this thing. So we see the functioning of a Melchizedek priest as he's, uh, uh, there's, there's this whole thing of wanting to transfer everyone from one life to another, from one reality to another, from one priesthood to another, from, from one understanding and viewpoint of things to another, from a mediator thing where we're still separate and we're still trying to get to God and we're still hoping for the best and we can still slip up. When we slip up, we're far away, but thank God that Jesus is still a mediator. Folks, Jesus finished the work as a mediator, which was to bring two together as one. And now he's an intercessor to intercede that we get this and that he intercedes by feeding us bread and wine. And he says what? What, what does he say? What is the introduction of the new covenant? This is my body. This is my blood. Eat it. This is the new covenant. You are a Melchizedek priest. Scott? Amen. Amen. Because it was the Levitical priesthood. But we were actually brought into oneness with Melchizedek, who was an eternal priest, and who has always believed this thing about oneness. It was always the plan. It was always the plan. It wasn't something new that just came up. This is it. And so he goes, okay, now, you guys tried it the old way and being separate and then, you, then I would make provision for you to get back together but as long as there's two there's always going to be some form of separation. This was the thing that was going off in the mind of Abraham when he looked at Lot and he said he's, he's divisive, he's critical, he causes problems but he's still one in the eyes of God. And I'm going to act like it. And I'm going to treat him like it. And God said, send my priest right now to that guy. <laughs> we need to sit down and have some communion together. He's the only guy I know that seems to be living off of the new covenant. Amen. Abraham had new covenant faith, folks. <laughs> I mean, it tells every New Testament, new covenant Christian faith of Abraham. Okay. So, um, 
And, you know, I, I guess you can keep your place here again because we will be right back. But I just, the, this, the thought of John 6 came to me. Uh, John 6, verse uh, 56. Jesus saying this, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in, and I in him. Okay, verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, he shall live by me. Folks, that's oneness. I and you, you and me, we're one. We're not separate. You may act separate. You may have a divisive mind. You may do things separate. You may be the biggest stinker around. But you are one. And quit looking at your brothers and sisters as if they're separate. They may be messed up in their doctrine. They may be messed up in some of the things they're doing. But they're one. And, and by, by beating them with division is not being a Melchizedek priest. Feeding them the truth of what they are will change them. Because you'll, they'll live as I live by my Father. So they will live by me. And then there won't be those problems. But we want to fix the problems. We want them to walk up and say, okay, you know, you're, devi lot, you're divisive and everything. You know, give me, let's talk about the problems and all the things that you're upset over. And what is, what is it you believe as opposed to what do I believe? And try to straighten out issues here on paper or something. Instead of, instead of Abraham saying, he's one, I treat him as one, I'll die for, for the fact that I believe he's one. And I'll feed him the communion of that we are one. But we usually, no, no, you're not one. You know, that'd be like a husband, you know, a wife acts contrary to him. And he just turns and goes, well, we're not one. Well, no, we are one. I mean, she'd go, no, we are one. I just, I just said some things I shouldn't have or I'm, I got off or whatever. Am I right or wrong? Are they one? You go, you know, you've been acting this way for a month. So I guess we're not one. What does the Lord, if he said that to her, what would he be looking for? He'd be looking for her to say, You're right, we're not one. Leave me, divorce me. I don't deserve you or anything. No. You think that pleases him? I'm a mess. You're right. No, he wants her to say, we're one, and I'm not leaving it. I am not leaving oneness. I believe in it. You see that God testing his own people. He tested Moses, you know. Well, look at these people. They're rebelling and everything. Else. I'll tell you what, Moses, I'll kill off all the people and raise up a new people by you. You remember that? God said that. You, you, and we read that and we go, well, God's really mean, man. I mean, he's ready to wipe everyone out. And, and Moses is the one who stands up and says, no, Lord, they're one with you. And this covenant is settled and we're one with you and we can't go that route. And so we go, wow, Moses, thank God for Moses, man, because God would have wiped us out. God knew what he was doing. He wanted Moses to say, look, I believe this thing. I'm in, I'm in with this thing. We're one. You can't do that. It's not the way. And God goes, dude. Well, maybe not exactly like that. But, but you know, he's, he's glad to hear. Folks, there's a bunch of examples in that. I know you, I mean, a I've seen them over and over where God seems to be saying something contrary, but every time it's just to draw out of that, the person that he's doing that with, where they will stand up. You know, you see that with uh, Naomi and Ruth, you know, okay. No, you, you know, go away. What is there with you? You know, come in with me and everything. I will not let, where you die, I will die. That's the cross. Your people are my people. That's resurrection. Why do you think she's in, in the book? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so anyway. Sorry, I get all worked up over this, but it's just incredibly powerful reality that God wants us to enter into. And, and how are we ever going to function as a Melchizedek priest if we don't understand what a Melchizedek priest is? He's a communion priest. 
He's a priest that bef before there was anything and after. That means you don't have to have sin, which means you don't need mediatorship. You just need to feed on the truth. And so he is he's giving the communion. He's giving us his body. This is my body. Take it. <laughs> no, I don't deserve it. Can you, you know, I mean, remember Jesus said that? This is my body. Take it. Huh. You know, it's kind of like Peter, you know. No, don't wash my feet. You know, no, I can't eat that if that's your body, you know. I might drop it and I don't want to drop the body of Christ. <laughs> Sorry, a little Catholicism working there. But, you know, he's saying to you, take it and eat it. This is my body now. I want it inside of you. I, want, I don't want this in your head. I want it in you to become you, who you are, how you think, the way you perceive. I want you to be a Melchizedek priest with me. And he's feeding us what he is. Because we keep thinking that we are what we are. Does that make sense to anybody? So he has to keep feeding us on the reality that's in his heart. The son sat down, we sat down with him in oneness. The high priest sat down, we sat down with him in oneness. When the high priest sat down, the mediator work was done, and he said, it's finished, now we're one. Now you're seated together in me in heavenly places. Right? One. Sat down in. We're one. And I'm not going to mediate on your behalf anymore because that's settled. Now I'm just going to intercede to feed you what is the truth so and of course you know when it says thou art a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek in the same place or in another place he said this is my beloved son that's speaking of us when he says to that priest you are and this is a resurrection truth you're his body that's you too anything that's true of him now is true of you because of oneness yes Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. And I will get into it. Well, you know what? No, no. I said I will get into it. My hope is. I have notes here to get into it, but there's so much yet to cover that I, I'm not sure how much I'm going to get into. Let's, let's just look real quick into um, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Still talking about, you know, priesthood and all that. Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy calling. You know, I don't know about you, but I remember about my first 10 years of being a Christian, and I would read something like this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And I'd go, you know, I'm, I'm barely saved. <laughs> He's talking to me like I'm, you know, He's talking to me like I'm one. But I didn't understand it. I thought, well, he's just being nice until I change. You know, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to encourage me because I know what I am. No, I don't. I know what I am after the flesh, but he no longer knows me after the flesh. He knows me in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Well, when's that going to happen? Anybody ever ask the Lord that? Old things have passed away. Well, when is that going to happen? They already have. The question isn't when. The question is where. In Christ, it has happened. In you, you need to see that it has happened and live according to it. So it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, the one called into Christ. Right? That's the high calling. That's the calling that's after the most high. The high calling. There's a lot of callings. Call to, you know, marry this person. Call to this ministry. Call, you know, call to that country. But folks, this is the high calling of God in Christ. In union with Christ. In heavenly places. Oneness. 
It is the greater calling. So he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. This is the one that he's trying to get us to consider. This Melchizedek priest. Consider this guy. Consider how when he showed up, he showed up with bread and wine. Consider, consider how when he sat down, when it's all done, and he's the only one that's done the will of God, and he knows, Jesus knows, that the disciples in just a short amount of time are all going to run to save their own skin, and they're all going to freak out, and they're going to lock themselves in an upper room for fear, and they're going to walk along the Emmaus Road saying, we had hoped he was the one, Jesus sits down and feeds them communion and says, you're my body and you're one with me and it's okay. Does anybody see how incredible that is? He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't say, now, you know, the only one he condemns is Judas because Judas will not believe. <coughs> but, there's, but as the lamb, he still gets down and washes their feet in type of their feet being part of the body, which is Judas. And you can, that's for you to search out. I've preached on it before and we got it on tape somewhere. But absolutely clearly, you, you, you get that tape if you, don't, if you can't see it in those scriptures. That whole issue, that whole issue of washing his feet was that there was one that was not yet clean and he still was counted as the body. He just needed to have the water of the word applied and wash away the dirt. Jesus, to the bitter end, would not give up on him. That's what that whole foot washing thing was about. We make it something else. You know, oh, you know let's just wash each other's feet. Yeah, yeah, but let's attack Judas. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, Jesus didn't attack Judas. Jesus is standing in the gap and washing the body and teaching them to do like I do. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. And, but I'm telling you, that is the context of that. It's that same Most High God at work, and it's the same Melchizedek priest who is counting us as one, even if we don't. And the decision to leave was Lot, and the decision to, to break was Lot, and the decision to break with Jesus was Judas's. But it wasn't Jesus's. Amen? So this is the high priest of our confession. This is the one that we are, you know, so strongly consider. This is the one that we're, we're, you know, that's given us access, entering into the temple. Oh, you know, actually we're entering into being the tabernacle of his body. Am I right? We're not entering into the temple. We're entering into being the temple. We're not trying to get in. We are it. Mediator people are trying to get in. Communion people are fellowshipping with him where he's at. And what's settled in his heart. All he wants you to do is eat it. Eat the communion. Be filled with his life and as his body. Melchizedek priest. And then he wants us to function by that same priesthood and not to treat everyone that's messed up as separate and outcast, but to treat them like they're one because Jesus said they're one. And Jesus hadn't given up on anybody. And Jesus is not going to give up. And if they have a bad attitude, you don't because you believe the truth. And if they hurt you, then you will still take it again if necessary to reach them. And you won't, you won't just run to them while they're still living in Sodom because they're not going to listen to you. But you will wait patiently for the time when, when their lack of, of embrace of the realities that's in Christ leads them to captivity, for surely it will. And then you will rush to their aid for one reason, because they're one and you believe they're one and you're going to be able to demonstrate to the glory of God, to the glory of the Most High God, this spirit, and then you're going to get to sit down and join in in a priestly meal with the Lord 
who wants to just sit down and eat the same thing you're eating and you want to sit down and eat the same thing he's been eating, lamb, the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, just help us to have our eyes open. I can't do that. And all my teaching and all my oomph behind my teaching makes no difference. The only thing that will make any difference is the Holy Spirit. Lord, if this is true, quicken the hearts of your people. And if it's not true, then blot it out where they won't ever even remember this. Because I do not care about what I'm teaching as if it's important. I care about what is only true from your heart. May that get through. And may that bring forth fruit in their lives. Father, I thank you. I thank you that through your son you did settle this whole thing. I thank you for that. And now I thank you as intercessors. We pray in a different way not as mediators. We don't pray as mediators. We pray as intercessors. And we impart to others who don't seem to be eating yet this body and life, this blood. We impart to them the communion of it that they may enter in and enjoy the meal with you, this marriage supper, this eating of communion that makes us one. So, Father, we just love you. We thank you. We put it into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're dismissed.